plans. We all make plans. Plans are important. We need them. But even the best made plans are not written on stone. Sometimes we are forced to change our plans. It might be because of unforeseen circumstances, new factors, unplanned or unexpected events, and new persons come into our lives. We may need to reschedule our plans, rearrange or just dump them for something new to embrace a new plan. Has it not happened to most of us? Sometimes a quick change in plans and we have got to think on our feet, adapt to a new situation. Sometimes we can stay rigid and unbending. And when we do so, we cause pain to ourselves and pain to others as well. For a person of faith who believes that the God of surprises is in the mix, or more accurately, God is at the heart of life, how do we look at plans, especially when a change is warranted or needed? How do we embrace these plans or be ready to adapt to a change in plan? Most importantly, how do we discern God's grace in them and respond appropriately? Now, in the countdown to Christmas, the two readings that we have heard today give us contrasting responses. In the first reading, the prophet Isaiah goes to King Ahaz. Now, King Ahaz of the kingdom of Judah is known and recorded as the bad king because of his way of ruling, the decisions and the plans that he made. Now, Isaiah goes to meet King Ahaz in the name of the Lord. And he says, ask for the sign. And he says the sign is limitless. The sky is the limit. As high as the sky, as deep as the netherworld. But what does Ahaz do? He says, I will not ask. I do not want to put the Lord to the test. I don't want to tempt. What King Ahaz is doing is in a very pious way, but hypocritical and crooked manner, is trying to say, don't get God involved in my plans. Why does he say that? Because he's made up his mind already. He's already made up his plans. And what are his plans? Let's understand the historical context. He's in the southern kingdom of Judah. In the northern kingdom of Israel, there is a fight going on between these two neighbors as well as Syria. So what does King Ahaz do? He goes to an evil superpower, Assyria. He makes a pact with them. And he's deciding with the help of them to crush his two smaller neighbors. He might have won the battle, but he lost the war. Because he ended up paying a big sum of money. Because now he was a vassal of the superpower Assyria or colony. And under their thumb. But what does he do? He puts a pious face and says, I don't want to tempt the Lord. But that's not going to stop the Lord from acting. And therefore, Isaiah says to him, the Lord himself will give you a sign even if you reject. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now, this was a prophecy that was being made. And they looked for it to happen. And just after King Ahaz, there was King Hezekiah, another king, a good king, but he did something, but he wasn't what the promise foretold. And so they began to look to the future, looking for that time when there would be a Messiah. Seven centuries later, finally, that prophecy came to be fulfilled. And that brings us to the gospel of today, because in that gospel, we hear the fulfillment of that prophecy of Isaiah. Now, we heard about the plans of King Ahaz. What about the plans of Mary? She herself has made plans. She's betrothed to Joseph. She's going to marry him. Now these plans are going to get messed up big time. So when the Archangel Gabriel comes to her, first of all, she's troubled with the greeting, wondering what can this be? Like in times of old, you got a telegram. You wondered, is it good news or bad news? And yes, here she's, She's, she's going to hear 
what the archangel is going to say to her in the name of God. She's told that she will be pregnant even before her marriage. And in a small place like Nazareth, can you imagine how it must have set the tongues wagging? Because you and I have the benefit of years later knowing that the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, that the Archangel Gabriel was there. But for Mary, it must have been such a challenge. Try explaining that to the simple people of Nazareth. But she's not only told that, she's told that the promise of the ages, the Son of God himself, is going to be nurtured in her womb. Can you imagine this young woman of Nazareth struggling to understand and to grasp this reality? What a mighty change in plans. This would be enough to give any of us a heart attack, as they would say. Now, the Gospel text describes this whole process in just a few lines. But I would see really it is as an unfolding process in the life of Mary, just as we listen to the dialogue. She discussed and she dialogued. How can this be possible? She prayed about it. She discerned and then she decided, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. She knew that if this was God's will, God is going to give her the grace to go through it all, to make these plans come to fulfillment because God, with his grace, makes the impossible possible. Two approaches to God's plan. Two styles. Which one is mine? How do you and I make plans? What is the process that we follow? How do we discern what is best for all in the light of God's will? None of us are islands. We live in relationships. We live in a family. We are connected with people. We live in a religious community of sisters, priests, brothers. None of us are islands in making plans. We do not act unilaterally or without a thought given to others. We are accountable. We are responsible for the people we live with or are entrusted to our care, whether in homes, families, or religious communities. How do we plan? How do we discern? Some really consult, reflect, dialogue, pray, and then decide. There are a number of homes and families and marriages who do this and who do this well. And when that happens, there's so much of joy, peace, understanding, trust, and that relationship deepens. On the other hand, there are others who decide all by themselves without even listening to the voice of the others in their home, their family, or their religious communities. Some may suffer from narcissism. The world revolves around them and their needs alone. Some make all the plans, they take all the decisions, and they justify it by saying, I know well, I know best, others don't know better. If that is so, then the best we can do is to empower others so that they will not stay that way. To say not knowing better, of being inexperienced or incompetent is no excuse because we merely judge them with the labels we put on them until we empower them and we take people into confidence. We make plans together for what is best, not just for me selfishly, but for the group, whether it's the family, the home, or our religious communities. My dear friends, the best decisions are God-inspired decisions and seeking to do the most loving thing, which finally benefits not just myself alone, but the larger group. As Christians, ultimately it's not just what I want, but what God wants of me and God wants of us. In the first reading, King Ahaz, we see very piously but crookedly rejects the plan of God. In the Gospel, Mary, the mother of Jesus, embraces this plan. Of course, she had to wrestle, she had to struggle, and that's what we do most of the time. But Mary, our mother, did it all the same. She discussed, she dialogued, she prayed, she discerned, and then decided. Joseph, her spouse, had to do the same. 
because that is the way of life. That's the way of the world. And that's the way of allowing our hearts to beat with the heart of God. Mary said, let it be done to me according to your word. In other words, as St. Alphonsus would love to say, I will it because God wills it. In this, therefore, let Mary be our inspiration, our model, and our guide.